Hey there chemists, in this lesson we're going to look at some stereochemically controllable reactions primarily that we learned last semester. For example, the epoxidation of an alkene. If I epoxidize the alkene that I see here, remember you change the alkene into a three-membered ring with an oxygen, and everything else is along for the ride. Now, last semester, if we did this on an achiral alkene, uh, we would say you get the racemic mixture, but look at the difference in this example. Now I have a pre-existing asymmetric carbon, and I created a new asymmetric carbon, and it turns out that that's formed very selectively so that you only get this diastereomer. In other words, the existing stereocenter controlled the outcome of the new one that's formed. This is called a diastereoselective reaction. And we can explain this with a phenomenon known as allylic 1,3 strain, minimizing allylic 1,3 strain. To illustrate that, I'm going to redraw this molecule where I rotate around that carbon-carbon bond and specifically point out where this allylic hydrogen prefers to be. It's all about that spot and the fact that it's allylic, which remember is one away from the alkene. So let's redraw that. And the way you redraw it as an energy minimum is to show the allylic H in the plane and it's in the same plane as the vinylic H, uh, one, two, three atoms away. That's why this is called a 1,3 or allylic 1,3 strain. What I've done is I've rotated it just a little bit so that the H is now in the plane. That means the methyl is now in the back of your screen and the tert butyl is coming out toward you. But that's the lowest energy conformation when we're considering a 1,3 strain. So to minimize energy. The allylic and vinylic H's are in the same plane. So that's just why I redrew it that way. Now, let's think about what happens when this undergoes epoxidation. MCPBA will epoxidize, the alkene will attack the oxygen in MCPBA, and we've got two faces of this alkene, the front of your screen and the back of the screen, and clearly, the back of the screen is much less sterically crowded. The tert butyl group is very large, so as this alkene approaches the MCPBA molecule, or vice versa, it's gonna wanna come from, in this case, behind your screen. So you're going to get a product that looks like this. Redraw everything exactly the same and just change what's changed. So the new carbon-oxygen bonds are coming from behind the screen. So attack occurs at the less hysterically crowded face. And that actually is the molecule right up above it. Just rotated that bond back around the other way um, and uh, drew out the T-butyl group and I didn't draw any direction on that bond over there because there's no stereochemistry. But that one new stereocenter there is set relative to the one that was there in the beginning. So let's take a look at another example of this. Uh, this is a hydroboration reaction, and let's think about what the product is first. So hydroboration oxidation will uh, attach an H and an OH on the alkene. You'll get the non-Markovnikov, so the OH will go on the less substituted carbon. So my product like this with a new OH right there and then a new H on that position. I didn't draw in the hydrogen. Uh, the H and the OH are syn uh, and you'll notice we created a new stereocenter but we actually created it here not where the OH is attached and I'll tell you because of the existing stereochemistry you get the methyl pointed toward you in that regard so I would like you to try and practice this see if you can hit pause and redraw the starting material, minimizing the A13 strain, and then make sense of why attack occurs to give you this diastereomer in the end. Okay, let's see how you did. So I'm going to just redraw that starting alkene, and I'm gonna start with minimizing 
the A13 strain exactly the way I did before. This one happens to have a methyl right there, okay. And then I'll fill in what's attached. My methoxy is now pointing in the back of the screen, and we have an isopropyl coming out toward us. So we are competing between isopro uh, between methoxy and isopropyl. Isopropyl is not as big as tert-butyl, but it is quite bulky, so I predict that methoxy is going to be smaller. In fact, let's highlight that smaller group. We could go back and do that in the first one too. Methyl is clearly smaller. So the hydroboration H slash B will occur from the back of that alkene. So my isopropyl and my methoxy are along for the ride. The alkene is now a single bond. Uh, I'll draw the methyl in the plane of the page first, and then I'll show the new hydroboration result. You get a new OH on the less substituted carbon and an H on the more substituted carbon. Now, this is Orgo 2. We don't draw a direction on carbons that don't have any asymmetry to them, so the only reason I did that there is to remind you that this is a syn addition, but it turns out you only create one new asymmetric carbon. It's right there where the methyl is, and redrawing it just a little more cleanly gives you the product that we have up above. Remember, you can specify the stereochemistry with just one of the groups on an sp3 carbon. Here, I'm showing that the H is back, here I'm showing that the methyl is forward. Those communicate the same information. It's sort of personal preference, which one you think looks a little more cleanly, but you should be able to interpret both. Okay, so that's it for Alilic 1-3 strain, uh, but I said in the beginning that we we're gonna look at a number of reactions from last semester and how they just sort of have different consequences when the molecules are a little more complicated. The next one is just an addition reaction. Uh, this is an addition of halogen. Halogenation was one of the first reactions we learned. You get one, two dihalides when you react with an alkene but here we're using a conjugated alkene, and we get this very bizarre looking product at first. So let's try to draw the mechanism for this and see if we can explain what happens. My diene, same kind of molecule we saw in the Diels Alder not long ago, first reacts with bromine. Now there is a bromonium ion intermediate in this mechanism, but I'm going to bypass that and simply show the formation of the carbocation. And you should look at that and go, aha, that is a good carbocation. That is allylic. This is resonance stabilized. Uh, it's this cation directly that gets us to the addition product we're perhaps used to seeing from Orgo 1. You get the 1 2 product. Why is this called the 1-2 product? Well, number that carbon chain from 1 to 4. The addition occurs on carbons 1 and 2. There's another product. How do we explain this other product? It happens to be called 1-4 uh, for the same reason, uh, numbering the carbon chain. It's because of the resonance contribution of that cation. I could move a pair of electrons to give me a different contributor of the same thing. Remember, this is not a different molecule. This is a different representation of the same carbocation. Those are one thing drawn in two different ways, but the transition state can discriminate the outcome and the bromide could actually form a bond with the other contributor, let's say, and that gives you this other product, which we call the 1,4 product. So that just explains why we get those two. I want to go one step further and talk about how we can control the outcome. How can you get one over the other? And it turns out you can. It's just by controlling the temperature because the first product is what we call the kinetic product. And the second one is the thermodynamic product. Thermodynamic we usually use to mean the more stable product so the one that's lower in energy. Uh, the kinetic product is usually the one that forms faster. And to explain this rationale and show you some data, here you have on your notes, uh, the same reaction where the only thing that's different is the temperature. Here we have a rather warm temperature condition and here we have a very cold temperature condition. And you can see that the outcome 
is different based on just the temperature. When I have a warm condition, I primarily get the thermodynamic products. However, if I cool it down, if I don't give it a lot of energy, you get the kinetic products. That's shown in just being written as five to one, roughly, uh, which I got from one of your textbooks. So what explains this? Let's look at an energy diagram uh, to, to explain the rationale as we go from starting material to intermediate to products in this reaction. So I'm gonna draw a big energy diagram where our y-axis is energy and our x-axis is the reaction progress as we go from starting material to product. So let's first put our starting points and our end points in this. The starting point, I'm just gonna draw arbitrarily some horizontal line where we have our starting diene. There's our diene. Now our products, one, two, and one, four, differ in their energies. The more stable product, the thermodynamic product, is something that's lower in energy. So that would be the one, four. And the less stable product is the 1, 2 addition. Should be worth noting, why is the 1, 4 the more stable product? Zaitsev. More substituted alkene. Now what about the intermediate? The intermediate is one thing. It's the carbocation that we drew up there. Intermediates are usually higher in energy than either the starting materials or the products. So I'm going to draw it somewhere up here, sort of in between the two start the starting point and the end points, and I'll label it as that resonance stabilized cation. So here's the one contributor, but it is also the other. Those are one thing, because that's what resonance is. So what's the path that we undertake to get to these two different products? Well, to get to the thermodynamic product, we have to cross some activation energy to get to the intermediate. And then we, I'm actually gonna move these over just a little bit to give it a little more space. And then we, from the intermediate, to get to the thermodynamic product, cross some other transition state to go down there. What about the kinetic product? It's higher in energy, but we said it forms faster. That's what kinetic products mean. So from the intermediate, let's pick a different color here. Uh, you get to the same intermediate from the starting material by the same pathway but it's this second step in the reaction where the, the distinguishing happens between the two products. This is a case where we end at a higher energy uh, product, but we have to cross a lower energy barrier to get there. So I'm gonna put a very small hill that's underneath the thermodynamic product one, and then it's gonna cross paths with the other case. This is normally not what we see. Normally, more stable things also form faster. We've never gone into this kind of detail about reaction mechanisms for the most part because usually what forms faster is more stable. This is a very unique case where what forms faster happens to be less stable, but that's kind of an amazing thing in the laboratory because that means we can control it just by how much energy we give it. If we give it just enough energy, for example, cold temperatures, to only bypass that lower activation energy hump, we can funnel it into the kinetic product. If we give it a lot of energy, enough to overcome the, sec the, the higher activation energy, it can funnel into the more stable thermodynamic product. So let's just write a little bit about that. I can say here, the difference in products, there is a difference in transition states. That's what explains it. Remember that cation is one thing. 
But once the transition state occurs, it discriminates that cation and you get what look like two different versions of that resonance contributor. I'll show you what I mean. The one that's on the blue line right here is what leads to the thermodynamic product. So it looks like this carbocation, where you're starting to form a bond with the bromide. Transition states are when bonds are starting to form and other bonds are breaking, as opposed to this transition state, which is from the other version. And this we can also use Zaitsev's rule to explain why this is the more stable transition state, uh, sorry, less stable transition state, because uh, it looks more like a primary carbocation, as opposed to this one, which looks like a secondary carbocation. Wait, I thought they're both allylic. Yes, but when the bond starts to form, that cation is no longer delocalized across those two different carbon atoms. It's much more locked on one or the other position. So that's just a long-winded answer to why we have different energy states for those transition states and how we can actually use them to control which product you get. So the theme here was just how we can control the outcome of some alkene reactions using allylic 1,3 strain and even temperature when we have conjugated systems. We'll continue to look at more selective reactions as we wrap up this last unit of the course.